Okay, so welcome back. And uh, this is the second session entitled Domain Specific Languages. And we have uh, two presentations during this, uh, present during this session. And the first talk is by uh, Kai Hammer, who's going to uh, talk about using LISP macro facilities for transferable statistical tests. Yeah. So, everybody can you hear me? Yeah? Okay, great. So um, thanks for having me here. Um, this is kind of rehab. Um, I rediscovered Lisp like 25 years after I first used it, and I'm now like a Fortran programmer uh, in recovery. Um, I'm, you know, fed up with all that stuff, but I don't have time to get into a rant on JavaScript or something. So I will continue with my presentation, um, and I want to show you really why I think. Uh, the design decisions forced me actually to go to Lisp and its macro facilities um, because we are, and I will show that by giving you some introductionary remarks on statistics, why we work hypothesis driven, we have to you know, code all the time and rely on a lot of code base that eventually could be transformed by macros. Um, being subject to the third-party funding circus, um, I have to refer to those nice sponsors, which I've done now. Um, now to the content. So, um, so that you understand why I have chosen Lisp and what I think makes it worthwhile to pursue as a language, even in scientific computing, I have to give you some introduction and what, what is important for us. I will show you a very simple example that is sufficient um, to create th synthetic data for analysis. And then show the real interesting thing that is resampling techniques, which is, which is just a small subset um, of statistical computing, but still an important one. And derive some requirements on the code base that we need finally, um, and that DSL macros could um, address that. And probably you find uh, some interest in that and would like to participate, which I would uh, like to motivate here too. So. Where do we start? Uh, I have this funny affiliations with a lot of departments, but in the end, we do empirical science and rely heavily on data and, well, on a hypothesis, several of them. And to get from anecdotal evidence, um, it's important to get more than just data and the hypothesis. Um, you need something that tells you that that data is special, that there is a pattern, that there is something that reveals a mechanism or at least points you, indicates um, to a pattern that you probably can explain as a physicist or a biologist. And that means you have to use statistics. Um, there's no way out of that. Um, the world is noisy, um, and statistics seems to be the only way out of that problem. So, oh, you can hardly read that one. Um, so statistics... I leave out all the religious uh, fighting here. There are several camps, people discussing how to do statistics correctly. But what is important is to know that there's one branch where you do parameter-free statistics, so you just you know, use data. And the other that you cannot read is uh, parameterized models. Um, that is, you have a model. So you say you know the structure, the topology of your equations, and the only thing you, that you have to do is to fit data, uh, fit parameters, sorry. And to just show one example. So if you have a parameterized uh, model, say an autoregressive model that is for time series, you try to get um, under, an understanding of what the dynamics of the underlying process is. So you say, well, I think that the new value is some linear combination of previous values or so some history. And now it's only a question of fitting um, the C and the phi containing some error terms and you are done, right? And then you get all the insight from those phi's and those C and whatever. Um, but still you have to do actually an involved computation because you have to do this fitting under some loss function, which might be a problem and a challenge. But then when you have those parameters fitted nicely, you can learn something and say, well, I now know that this system is stationary or it's not, whatever. Um, Again, that fitting might be a very involved procedure, so it's not that easy. Just click it, and it's two lines of code. It might be actually some 100,000 lines of code. Um, then there is a parameter-free statistics, right? 
right? Where you just look into the data, and it's completely data-driven. And one typical example would be like computing the covariance of two time series. And so you just take that difference to the mean of both time series, make that um, sum, and you're done. And then you know, well, what is the connection between x and y? Probably. The problem here already is that you have to do something to gauge that value, because if I tell you these two time series have a covariance of 3.5 and these two of 4.5, what is a stronger one? You wouldn't know. So you have to have like a base level that you need to computationally uh, create or have you know, another experiment. But you don't, guess, don't get understanding here at that point, right? You just get a value out of it. And both directions, from my point of view, um, give you some estimation, some numerical even uh, estimates of what's going on. But you find them in the parameters or in these descriptive, descriptive values like the covariance. So that's what, you, what spilled out. It doesn't tell you really anything because what you need to know whether that is significant, what you get out, right? I mean, I can fit anything, but is that parameter really significant in the sense, is it indistinguishable or is it distinguishable from random noise or from, you know, some, well, what we would call a null model? Um, <clears throat> or are those descriptors typical or are they special in some way? And that is the term significance. And now comes the mandatory XKCD slide. Um, because we can obviously um, use a lot of stuff and apply that, but we need to have a very simple toy model because otherwise we fall for that problem that correlation is not causation and we are already uh, always interested in causation. So we have to have a, a toy model that we can control and I cannot apply it for tests in <coughs> real data because in the real data I would probably mix up a spurious correlation uh, with the real causation. Um, so, we need, first of all, before we go into the, um, the mechanisms of statistics, we need something to create data that we then analyze and that we can control. And you can find that in the paper um, just briefly. This is a logistic uh, uh, equation. It provides for chaotic dynamics. So it's very complicated, let's say. And then I've created another time series from that, uh, or I've created a time series just Keep in mind, this is independent. It's just doing its stuff, and it is not coupled to anything else. And those three guys are coupled to each other, right? Because this two gets his, his, his past, his history, but also the one from, from the first equation. The three gets it actually from two and one, so it's coupled. And you see that if you make that plot. Um, obviously, if you know x2 and x1 coordinate, you know something about the x3 coordinate, right? It's a manifold somehow. Um, so we have a toy model where we can also slightly modify the coupling by those prefactors. Fine. Okay, back to what's really interesting. So now after my toy model, I told you we have to somehow estimate the significance of what's going on. And one way to do that without a model, actually, because models are tricky, you have to at least have an understanding what the mechanism might be to formulate a, an equation with some parameters, right? Resampling is just applicable to everything because you only use data. And uh, resampling is used so that you know, or figure something out about the underlying distribution of your observations, right? So you don't know the model, you don't know the process really, but you have the data and now you try to get some insight into the distribution of values. And there are actually quite a lot of them, um, but there are three main uh, variants. And the first one is jackknifing, where you have, in the end, an estimate of the variance and bias in your uh, uh, descriptive variable that you want to compute. Um, and it's going by repeated several times, say 10,000 times, um, delete the many entries from your original data and recompute whatever you're interested in, the descriptor. Um, the D is a parameter, um, but that tells you how sensitive your uh, descriptor for the original data is uh, with respect to some deletion or insufficient sampling. Bootstrapping makes an approximate distributions of the test statistics. So it's, go it's actually going one step further. You repeat, uh, and what do you do? You do random samples with replacement and, well, and actually, oh, I'm missing that line. You recompute your test statistics, and then you get a distribution of these descriptive values 
and now you know where your original value lies, right? Now, is it more typical value or a very, uh, or an outlier? Um, and then there's permutation tests. Um, that is really about the significance. This is about if you have two different random variables and you want to understand how they correlated or three of them, um, you shuffle the data column so you destroy artificially the correlation uh, between two, three, or four, or whatever columns in a big table, and you recompute with test statistics. So if you look closely on that slide, you see there exists a pattern in all those uh, resampling procedures, right? And the, pro the pattern is you repeat the following two steps for thousands of generations or of repetitions. You create some sample from the data. Either you leave something out, you shuffle, or you pick something with replacement, and then you evaluate probably a complicated function on it, right? That's the overall pattern. And what comes out is, in some way, a list of the function applied to the sample one of repetition one, the function applied to sample two, and so on and so on. And how you now <coughs> uh, analyze that sample of data, of, 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 of values, that's a whole different story that I will not address today. Um, so you can do something with them, whatever. So in general, you not only have two or three random variables, but instead we face the problem, or it's actually very good because we have a lot of data, um, we have several values several variables, x1, x2, that somehow fluctuate and do their uh, random thing. Now, we probably are interested in not correlation between two variables, but say in correlation in three variables. And now you might say, wow, that's like also some theoretical argument, but it isn't. So I can show you, not here, but for example, in protein evolution, you find that like three, four places are correlated to each other. So those biomolecules co-evolve not only two places or two positions at a time, but several of them at, at the same time. And that's basically because they, they occupy volume, right? And if I'm the big guy, then I push three or four out. So the big guy has influence on several others at the same time. So we need to look at probably up to D many variables. So the first thing is uh, what you need to do now is to have an iterator going over all, well, basically a grid of which um, random variable do I want to have as like the first, which do I want to have as the second and so on and up to the dth. Because if I want to have the correlation between d many values, I somehow have to go through all of my data which might have actually or be a table of 100 columns and now I want to pick every three tuple out of that, right? So I have to go <coughs> over that. Um, that is nice. You can do that very easily. Um, probably there's a better way, but I have a small side effect there. I need to go into that object, and I cannot rely on standard uh, counters there. But that, that worked immediately. That was good news. So what would come out now? That is now a two... Uh, a two correlation table, so to speak. So you correlate x1 and variable x1 on the sample s1, s1. You correlate, look for a correlation between x1, x1 in the sample s2, s2. Then, well, you have here the same with x1 versus x2 in the first sample, in the second sample, in the third sample, in the fourth sample, and so on and so on. Meaning we have three random variables here. We want to look for correlation between pairs of them, that means we have three times three um, combinatorics, and each of them works on a different sample, or works on the same samples, right? S1, S2, S3, S4, and so on. And that means basically that is embarrassingly parallel, right? Because it's data parallel, um, apply everything. That's very good news, and it works quite nicely even on the GPU, so not with this bad this time, um, but we did it on GPUs already. So, but now it's important we have a lot of data. And what you don't want to do here is to copy the data all the time. And at the same time, depends on what your F is doing, you might have asynchronous uh, computations. So you cannot really shuffle around the original data because that you are still stuck here think about a gradient method that is not converged here, but this guy is already 
on the first sample. So if you would do something on the original data, you might be in big trouble. Plus, you would have cache misses and, you know, whatever. So you cannot really work and shuffle and pick on the, on the real data. Instead, you have to have um, something, well, a lookup table, basically, of indices. That is, these indices, like the original indices in the original table, line number two, column number five, you want to avoid that. Instead, you want to have um, a lookup table. Um, so what I, oh, holy. Um, so what I, I introduce and what works with macros is an R-like uh, uh, syntax. So you just write your variables like D is the data, and then you indicate I have a variable A and a variable B, or John and Jane. Um, and then I go with a macro over the, the S expression of my F and replace the actually important lookup tables for the integers in, in those places. Um, that is just to show you that it's, what, several lines. You find it in the paper. The code is downloadable. Um, what you basically get is you, you look over the, the S expression, extract those D, dollar, whatever expressions, make a hash list of them, a lookup table. Um, you make the you build the, the, the returning array of data, and then you go over all combinations of indices and uh, evaluate, in the end, your F on those data. Um, you can do, so, so resampling procedures with an internal parameter, you just define it with a closure, then you, over, you give that closure probably to this resampling uh, macro that goes over like this expression, um, that is, <clears throat> you do a permutation test. Oh, it's hardly readable, too. Um, with expect expectation values, I go back here. So with expectation values over your A and your B variable minus, and you see this is basically the, the S, A, S expression for the covariance, right? So you have the expectation value of A, of B, minus, and then you do an expectation value of the product. And in the end, that is just analysis. I wanted to skip that part anyway. Uh, you basically look how significant or how um, unexpected those values are. And for my little toy example that I can play around with, it turns out it's actually doing the right thing, right? Um, the diagonal is not really relevant, but it doesn't find any significant correlation between this independent system and any of the x's, while the x's are all dependent, as you see indicated by the large value, the one uh, are <coughs> somehow connected, so they are identified to be causally or con correlationally uh, uh, connected. And there are two things that need to be done in the future, I think, that is aggregating functions. Um, the typical one is doing an, an, an expectation value, which is just the ar ar arithmetic mean of uh, the sample. So this is the lookup table of indices. You go over that, build the average, and you are done. So the sampling is actually contained in the lookup table, and you are fine. However, um, we, what we do here is that the F uses you know, the abbreviation by name of those uh, variables by transparently from outside. Um, but we need other functions, so say a histogram or fitting a kernel uh, internally. And that's not included yet, but should be very easy. Um, there is an appropriate macro for that. Um, I still have not done it. Okay, so the overall architecture is you have the AST of your function, you have your data, from the data, you extract some numbers, like how many variables do you have, how many data points do you have. You plug it into that macro that relies on, the cl on a class of this grid of indices. And then you go <coughs> to a macro that parses at this time only the expectation value, but in the future more. And then you get some pure list code from macro uh, expansion and can run it. What's also important would be memorization. And I can do that, obviously. That's not the problem. The problem, well, you see, you, several times you call the expectation value if, if you naively would apply that. So you want to have a memorization technique for that uh, expectation value because it doesn't, doesn't change after resampling because it's just the expectation value of this particular row, that uh, column, right? So and that doesn't change. I mean, you change the order of that column, but you do not necessarily change the content. Um, the problem is that because the f might be a very complex function with including sampling like uh, 
uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo, you do not know really if that aggregating function besides the expectation value for which memorization works um, is really pure. So there might, be, there might be some side effects. And I don't know what to do here at that point. So I can do it for expectation value, fine, but not necessarily for all aggregating functions. So either I have to switch, which I do not like one. No. Well, Haskell would be the one, but I doubt that this is a good idea. Or we have to inspect the aggregation function for side effects, which would probably be kind of an um, entscheidungsproblem somehow. Uh, so I want to avoid that. And now comes the summary. So I'm on my last minute. Um, what I wanted to convey is that resampling is computationally demanding, but addressable by the parallelization techniques. Um, we have hypotheses. We can implement those hypotheses in X, S expressions and evaluate their significance by resampling techniques. Um, to that end, we have to transform the AST of, the, uh, of that hypothesis to accommodate all the different variables that might occur. And then, um, in the end, we, at that time, we need more aggregation functions because there are more involved statistics uh, that you can do. And in the end, uh, I need some help to solve the memorization problem besides the simple thing that you can do. Um, and if you would like to you know, contact me on that and get in discussion or so, that's my email address. I would like to have a repository system where people could collectively work uh, on code, but unfortunately there isn't, at least not a trustworthy one, I think. So um, we would, in that case, if someone is interested, set up something at our own infrastructure because you do not rely on other people's infrastructure, I think. Thank you. There's time for questions. Yes. You mean this? What, what can you discard? As far as I understand, you could discard the lower, the lower part of the Yes. Well, nah, not necessarily. Um, so the, the question was whether that is basically a tri diagonal matrix, um, and the lower part, because of symmetry, would be the same. It is the same for, the, say, the covariance. But there are other measures like the transfer entropy um, that are not symmetric. So the table, you have to compute the full table. You could probably have like an, a small flag saying, oh, I'm symmetric for the F, or you have to in inspect it with a code walker, I don't know. You can do that, but that's just a factor of two. I wait one year, and then the computer is, you know, is faster, right? <laughs> Okay, so the, the question, if I got it correctly, was uh, about the pureness problem and the memorization problem, um, whether that is for practical purposes or theoretical purposes. So we are on record, so I have always to be, you know, that this is very important for natural science. So actually, I, I would find it for theoretical purposes very interesting, period. Um, so that is in its own. But in the end, you could, you could argue even in practical terms, it's, it's a difficult problem because the truth is um, sometimes we, we, we rely on uh, foreign code, right? So there's a foreign function interface somehow, and we do not know what's doing. We cannot do even the inspection, right? So even that wouldn't work. Um, we could do, for practical purpose, say, well, the user has to provide a, a clause object implementing the function and there is some method or some field saying this is pure or not. That would be a practical solution, obviously, but it's not as aesthetic somehow, right? It's, and, and the code from outside could be one of the lines of code, so you do not want to re-implement that on your own. I don't have the resources. Is that okay? Other questions?
Yes. Yeah, so, um, and we are on record again, so I have to be very careful. I heard that there is a huge platform with a big company that is named after a revision control system with three letters. Um, and my impression is, when I read the blog of Eric, Eric S. Raymond, that there is a lot of political correctness going on. And so this is the political side, but more speaking from an economical side, it's always bad to support monopolies. Um, as every computer scientist should be aware of. Um, and now you have that monopoly, and you rely on that infrastructure. And then, I guess, the JavaScript people just recently learned what happens if a private infrastructure just shuts down some portions, you know. Um, so, <clears throat> I have a colleague who once said in his Swiss accent, um, very, well, Wenn man etwas richtig haben will, muss man es selber machen. So when you want to have it correctly, you want to do it on your own. Um. We have time for another question. Oh, what, what, to, to just put something on top of it. I mean, if we do that, and all our scientific work relies on that, then I cannot rely on a company where I don't have really a contract with that includes penalties and so on, right? It's, it's, I, I need to, to at least grab those guys and shake them and get the dollars out. Um. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you.